Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Margarita Klamek, and I'm the fellow in economics here at Somerville College, and it's a great pleasure to be chairing this event today. Um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is, without a doubt, is one of the most defining geopolitical events in Europe since 1945. This war has already destroyed the lives of millions of Ukrainians, with over 14 million Ukrainians being displaced either internally or externally, and millions of lives being destroyed. Uh, in addition to this massive human costs and numerous tragedies, the invasion has also dramatically affected the economies of Ukraine, um, Europe and beyond. It has profoundly destabilized the geopolitical situation of the West and is leading to a major reorganization of the global security order with different realignments on the way. There are a number of countries that, in, that are in the process of joining NATO, while some old partnerships are under pressure and new alliances are formed. Given this dual shock to economy and geopolitics, it's crucial to reflect on the evolution as well as interaction since the war began, but also to think about the potential next steps for the future, not least when economic reconstructions will be necessary, just as security threats are likely to endure. I'm very delighted to have two experts who are ideally placed to, to those unique insights into those emerging issues and challenges. So it is my great pleasure to introduce to you our two fantastic speakers, both Somerville alumna, Catherine Royal and Serhii Maslichenko. Um, just a couple of words about our speakers. Um, Catherine, uh, following her studies um, in Oxford and in Wales, she started her 28 years long career as a British diplomat at British Embassy in Santiago in 1986. She returned to the UK in 1991, where she worked on various aspects of UK policy in Iraq until 97. Catherine then joined um, Dublin as a first secretary for the EU and economic affairs. And then she later was a head of the policy union on the Convention for the, future, for the Future of Europe. Catherine spent seven years in Latin America, where she was first a deputy head of mission in Buenos Aires and then um, a British ambassador to, ambassador to Venezuela. Later, Catherine worked as a deputy ambassador to the British Embassy in Kabul, and since 2015, she has been a political advisor at NATO. Um, Serhin did his PhD at um, Kiev National Economic University, just one metro station away from where I did my undergraduate degree. Mm -hmm. He first worked uh, for the Parliament of Ukraine before joining the Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine as an economic advisor. After his postdoctoral fellowship in Oxford, he then joined an Oppenheimer Technical Assistant Consultants and established an NGO which provided expertise on economic and energy related issues. Next, he spent almost 13 years at EBRD overlooking and managing energy related operations in a number of countries. In 2019, he returned to the government of Ukraine as a deputy minister at the Ministry of Energy and Environmental Protection. And since 2020, he established a private equity fund specializing in green investment. Last month, so he returned to EBRD as the um, head of EBRD in Kosovo. So each speaker uh, will, in order I've introduced them, I will speak for about 20 minutes, which will then be followed by what I'm sure will be a lively Q&A. Um, in the meantime, please be thinking about questions you might want to pose. Um, before I pass on to Catherine for our first intervention, please welcome me in, joining, in welcoming them both. Thank you, good afternoon everybody. It's a real, real pleasure to be here. It's also an honour to be here really, to be here with two representatives of the Ukraine people because they're in many ways, they are fighting for us, for our values and for our way of life. And I feel that really quite keenly as somebody who works for NATO. Russia is not currently able to pose a significant conventional military threat to NATO territory. But the toll is incredibly clear. We see it in every evening news and every picture that comes across our laptops with the destruction and havoc that's been caused in Ukraine. You and your people are paying the price for all of us, and we need to acknowledge that and be grateful for it. I really also need to tell you that I am speaking in a personal capacity. I'm not here as a representative of NATO, so everything I say is really what I think and not policy. 
And that's the bit now where I do a turn and turn from a sort of person who's appreciating the human conflict into an official who talks about the geopolitical stuff and, and what's going on. Talking to you today is, is difficult, not just because of the suffering that's happening in Ukraine, but because of the sheer speed of events. I mean, this week alone, Russia has downed a US drone. We've all seen the fantastic footage of that. Finland has decided to pursue accession to NATO without its Swedish neighbour, and it looks now that that's going to happen very soon, as both Turkey and Hungary have said it can go forward. Poland and Slovakia have decided that they're going to give Ukraine MiG jets. President Xi is going to Russia, and the ICC has indicted Putin for war crimes. So it's quite hard to keep up when all of that happens in just a week. And NATO finds itself in really quite a strange situation. Europe is not at peace. NATO nations have, and I say this without being an international lawyer, but as someone who knows a few of them, NATO nations have, by their supply of lethal aid, probably crossed the line not to be parties to the conflict, but to the point that if Russia were to attack those supply lines, it would probably be legitimate. Nobody wants this war to become a direct armed conflict between Russia uh, and the West. We don't want a conflict for very good reasons between nuclear armed states. But it is already a conflict in terms of information, in terms of cyber attacks, in terms of using the weaponization of energy and all those things that people tend to talk about as hybrid warfare. We obviously don't want Ukraine to lose. And it's you'll hear lots of our political leaders say quite correctly that Ukraine must be the people who decide their own fate. But I think we all know that it's not quite that simple. Ukraine is dependent on our help, particularly on American help. And these are decisions that our leaders are going to have to be involved in. I'm glad it's not my call. I wish that I could say that I'm going to tell you what the answer is to how this war ends. Obviously not. If I could, I'd be the next Secretary General. And as you know, we're looking for one. And despite him having put his hat in the ring, I'm pretty sure it's not going to be Boris Johnson. Um, so having hopefully not disappointed you in that regard, but disappointed you because I don't know the answer to the difficult question of how to end this terrible war, what am I going to say? I'm going to give you a quick recap of what NATO has done since 2014, which was when this war started. We need to stop thinking that it started last year. I want to have a quick look at the state of the conflict, the state of Russia, and then what NATO is doing now. And then a quick look around the world, because while we're rightly focused on Ukraine, uh, there be dragons in other places too. I'm not going to talk about China because I'm not a China expert, but let's just bear in mind that in a NATO context, the US will soon switch its focus towards China sometime soon. And if Russia's a storm, China's climate change. And we had all better be ready for this. So after the invasion of Ukraine in 2014, NATO and NATO nations actually did a lot. They did a lot fairly slowly because the alliance is an oil tanker. Its uh, decisions require consensus. And when there are 30 members, soon to be 32, getting that consensus is quite complicated. And I keep, you'll keep hearing me talk about NATO and NATO nations. And that's because, because we have to work by consensus, quite often a group of nations are doing things as a sort of coalition of the willing, to use that phrase. Sometimes a NATO badge gets put on it because nations don't mind that that activity gets associated with the alliance. Um, but for various reasons, the alliance couldn't manage to do it on its own, perhaps not in the time frame, or perhaps it was taking a while before you got consensus. And sometimes, therefore, you are looking at action by NATO nations, but it's assumed to be NATO as an organisation. And that is certainly how our adversaries see it. There is no difference in their minds, and we need to think about that as we form our policy. So post-2014, what did we do? There were assurance measures for the states in the east, air policing, maritime groups deploying far more exercises. We did what we thought hoped would deter so demonstrations of capability and um, bomber task forces, which is what they're called when uh, the Americans fly uh, their bombers down the uh, the international uh, in international airspace, but fairly close to Russian airspace, sometimes in our airspace. We also have done quite a lot about readiness, trying to sort out our own military and get ourselves in a position where we actually could fly if, fight if we had to. 
and we supported Ukraine. An enormous amount of training went on in Ukraine from NATO nations in the period since 2014. And you are seeing the results of that in some of the um, uh, military activity. Most importantly, there's been a mindset change in NATO from the expeditionary from Afghanistan and Kosovo to collective defence, back to collective defence. We also started writing some plans. You'll possibly be surprised to know we didn't have any defence plans. Um, so after 2014, we started writing what were known as graduated response plans, GRPs, but they were not executable. They were not executable because although they had plans to deploy forces, we didn't have plans for the second part where we actually would have been doing defence. So we didn't have fully worked up plans. We hadn't made agreements about the authorities that the military authorities within NATO had had. We hadn't worked out the command and control and we certainly didn't have all the forces, so not executable. But they were a good start. We then, moving to 2017, deployed um, EFPs, Enhanced Forward Presence Battle Groups, um, to frontline states. The UK leads in Estonia, the US in Poland, uh, Germany and Lithuania and Canada and Latvia. Did it deter Russia? Possibly. We don't know, because, of course, one of the problems is knowing that um, did they intend to do something or not? How do you know? It's quite difficult and it's a conversation we need to be having at a more sophisticated level. But we do know that Russia didn't invade. But the whole thing was very messy. There was, I think if you're going to do deterrence, there has to be a clear message. And the analogy I've been using talking to my military colleagues about it is that what we've done has been like an orchestra tuning up. We've made a lot more noise, but there's been no melody. So if you were the Russians, what are you perceiving as the message? Not quite sure. So my headquarters, which is at the operational level, so you have the political level, you have SHAPE, the strategic military level, the supreme headquarters of the Allied Powers Europe. Fantastic name, glad they didn't change it. And then the Joint Force Commands, which are three of them. Uh, mine is based in the Netherlands um, and it is in charge of basically from Estonia down to Hungary. Um, and my commander would run the defence of that area if we ever went to war. So that's the level I work at. And my headquarters has been trying to coordinate all that activity that started from 2014 onwards. 85% of it has been NATO nations rather than NATO. Um, and um, he did not really have the authority to tell people what to do. He's just had to ask them nicely if they could inform us. And we've tried to work out how to make that work to uh, give the most um, uh, readiness improvement, but also the most effective deterrent signal. Meanwhile, when all of that was going on in the south of the alliance in 2015 and 16, you'll remember that there was a tremendous migration crisis and NATO really struggled with that partly because there was a huge political focus on the East, while there was what the Southern states felt was a real, actual, live problem in the South. And that was a pretty difficult time uh, for the Alliance. It made regionalisation a dirty word. Um, and, uh, and of course, while NATO must look 360 degrees around, that sort of dogma had some strange consequences when we had uh, Italian forces carrying out a massive exercise in the Arctic. Um, they would never fight there. We're not that mad. Saka would send uh, the, the soldiers that have those specialist skills, but that's politics for you. Meanwhile, we were doing all of this with a strategic concept from 2010 that described Russia as a partner. Um, not because people thought that Russia was still a partner, although some people were hoping we could get back to that, but because it's sometimes wise to defer difficult conversations and difficult decisions in NATO until states and people are ready for them. So that's the road we were on when everything changed last year. Um, and of course, in the run up to that, as you all know, the US decided to go public with its intelligence to say exactly what Russia was doing. And that was to call them out and make them have fewer options because we said publicly we knew what they were up to. Some say that as NATO didn't take any action in light of that intelligence, it means that NATO failed and deterrence failed. The trouble is that it, it wasn't a deterrence failure. The intelligence also said that this was, there was a very low risk of an attack on NATO territory. And like it or not, it was not NATO policy to deter an attack on Ukraine. Some nations moved to that policy, most of them quite late in the day, but it was not NATO policy. We can discuss that. 
So just over a year since the conflict started, but we're nowhere near the end. We're seeing the awful images of, of trench warfare, the attacks on civilian, civilian infrastructure. But that tells us that Russia's not about to win and Ukraine's not about to lose. The appointment of Gerasimov, the chief of the general staff, to run the Russian campaign suggests that Putin isn't satisfied. But as far as we can tell, he doesn't want to move to a defensive position. And I think we're expecting both sides to do spring offensives in the coming months. Russia may even try another attempt on Kyiv, but there's no reason to think it'll be more successful than the last one. Russia seems to be struggling to provide its troops with modern weapons. The missiles appear to be in short supply, and that's perhaps why we saw hypersonic weapons being used recently, although it may also be a measure to intimidate Ukraine. Even Wagner is not getting the supplies of ammunition that they, they demand, and that's straining relations between the Russian army and the Wagner group. At the beginning of the year, there were some ambiguous announcements from the Kremlin about readiness for negotiation. And now China's offered uh, to be a mediator and presented what they call a 12 point peace plan. But despite this, the Russian leadership's also confirmed that they're getting ready for a prolonged conflict. And there have been some signs they're thinking about a second wave of mobilisation. The first wave caused some public dissatisfaction, partly because it exacerbated regional inequality within Russia. And with bodies now being shipped home, apparently the killed in action numbers reportedly now exceed the whole of Russia's Afghan campaign. The fact that a second wave is being considered gives us an insight into the state of the campaign. Any second mobilisation probably wouldn't have a huge military effect and would be a high political risk. So do the Russian people support the war? It's very hard to tell. The polls, such as they are, seem to tell us that they do still support the war, but they would also support peace talks but Russian people don't seem to expect the war to end anytime soon. The Kremlin's been increasing pressure from, on Belarus to enter the war. Lukashenko doesn't want to, and he may not have the capability. His forces are much more um, uh, capable of doing internal repression than they are of doing um, warfare. He'll continue to assist Moscow, he has to. His territory will be available to launch attacks, and by keeping his own and Russian troops near the border, he forces Ukraine to divert military effort against that potential threat. Ukraine's resolve remains high despite significant losses. The numbers are a very closely guarded secret and they're a lot less than Russia's, but a very high price is being paid. Zelensky's 10 point peace plan, which he would like to be discussed internationally, is not a plan of compromise. Withdrawal of Russian troops from all of Ukraine is one of its main conditions and Ukraine society remains consolidated despite enormous Russian efforts to sow dissent. Ukraine, meanwhile, is also taking action against corruption, as indicated by sackings and changing, changes in government. And the West wants to see that. It's a necessary condition of Ukraine's aspiration to join the EU. The Western resolve to support Ukraine remains high. Russia's hope that Europe would have energy shortages over the winter that we're just coming out of have been dashed. The Western public support is likely fuelled by the ongoing strikes on civilian infrastructure and by Russia's war crimes, which Ukraine publicises very effectively. The new commitment of tanks, of infantry fighting vehicles and now jets is a significant change of policy. It's too soon to know if it'll be a military game changer, uh, but um, we shall see. The jets, maybe, but we don't know if the numbers will be high enough yet. So what about Russia more broadly? Well, their economy is shrinking, um, GDP de declining the forecast to somewhere between 2.3 and 5.6% this year and inflation about 5 to 6%. Sanctions are having an effect, despite Russia working very hard to evade them. The Russian government's recognised a drop in energy sales and the head of the Russian central bank has warned of failing living standards. Russia's unlikely to run out of money to fight the war this year. But people will be feeling the pinch, particularly if Russia switches to a wartime economy. There's no investment coming in. There are long term effects on manufacturing, on tech development and they're being set in motion now and would take a long time to turn back. China and India could not compensate for the loss of Western markets and that won't be possible in 23 either. Shortage of workforce will become a factor, if particularly if, in, if there's further mobilisation and another related wave of emigration. And that will impact on the ability to reconstitute and modernise the military. The Russian defence industry had problems before. Now they've lost manpower, including the know-how to substitute Western technology. So how long would it take them to reconstitute their forces? Well, the NATO official estimate is three to five years. I think that's on the low end of the scale. I think it's probably more like seven to ten. 
And that period cannot start until this intense conflict ends. They're struggling to keep up with giving their soldiers ammunition. They won't be reconstituting. So there are economic difficulties. There's isolation from the West and problems with their relationships closer to home. My favourite poster boys are the Kazakhs, who went from asking the Russians to help in January last year and they got Russian troops to come and sort out some internal problems for them. And then they voted against them only a couple of months later in the United Nations. So, you know, in gratitude, your name is Kazakhstan, but I salute you. Um, the, the failures in the war and the mobilisation have increased the number of critical voices, but not sufficiently to, to threaten the regime. There are some cracks and infighting that have become visible on, on TV talk shows. There are some on Russian TV talk shows. There are some amazing debates, possibly showing, allowing people to vent. But, you know, maybe more than that. But they're not aimed at Putin and he does re remain firmly in control so far. Later in the year, the Kremlin will start the campaign for Russian presidential elections in March 24. Most people think Putin will run. Uh, handing over power could be a way to end the conflict, but I wouldn't put any money on it at this point. There are regional elections this autumn, including in illegally annexed Ukraine territories, and these elections will be a testing ground. But I think really the basic message is that Russia's in decline. It was before the further invasion of Ukraine. It's got demographic challenges, global move away from fossil fuel, effect of climate change, the rise of China. But they have actually managed in the last few uh, months to destroy part of their economic model, that is European energy dependency, and create some new strategic problems. The Baltic is becoming a NATO lake. Germany's changed its defence policy. But none of this removes Russia completely as a threat. Someone described Russia as a gas station with nuclear weapons. And of course, that is the problem. And that is really why we care. And of course, the weaker it gets, perhaps the bigger threats it gets in terms of its nuclear arsenal. And there's the dilemma for our policymakers. So on to NATO. We'll start with a new strategic concept because last year at the Madrid summit, we did manage to move beyond 2010 and we no longer think that Russia is a partner. What does the new concept say? It says that the purpose of this nuclear alliance is collective defence on a 360 degree and its core, its core tasks are deterrence and defence, crisis prevention and cooperative security. The threats are defined as Russia and terrorism. China's ambitions and policy described as challenging our interests, security and values. Cyberspace is contested, emerging uh, technologies pose a threat, and climate change is seen as the defining challenge to security. And key words include that NATO will defend every inch of its territory and deter and defend forward. So against that background, we'll have a look at where we are in terms of what we did as an alliance since the invasion. When it happened, the change in posture of NATO was fast, with nations deploying new military assets to the frontline countries. We activated the plans that I talked about, the GRPs. But whilst you might think that go means going to the cupboard and getting it out and following a course of action, in fact, it was really very different. My headquarters was instead tasked to use the authorities that were given to NATO's military commanders by activating the plan and then asked to devise a scheme of manoeuvre for deterrence and defence if necessary, using the forces belonging to NATO nations that they had deployed to the area with absolutely no coordination. So not so much executing a plan as reverse engineering how to use what happened to be on the ground. And that's what we're doing now, and it seems to be working. The Secretary General skillfully walked a difficult line. He kept the alliance together, he encouraged nations, but not NATO, to send uh, lethal aid and met thus major complications within the alliance have been avoided and managed. Putin still thinks he can see fissures in the alliance because there are always disagreements when you've got open democratic states talking to each other publicly. There are going to be differences of opinion, but so far they have not been exploitable by Russia and I don't think they're going to be. The US has led coordination of the supply of lethal aid, much of which has gone through uh, Poland, uh, and that is a continuing process. And in fact, if anything, it's growing. So the next summit is this July in Vilnius. And there we are going to approve new defence plans for Europe. 
And this is a massive change. Instead of asking nations to offer forces to operations, as we did when NATO was only thinking about places like Afghanistan, the aim is now to have sufficient forces at states of readiness to deter Russia and, if necessary, defend every inch of territory. And for the south of the alliance, there'll be plans to combat terrorism. The bill for this has not yet been calculated, but it will be big. Internally, the political guidance 23 that's just been issued is a big sign that things are changing. We are aligning our defence spending and procurement plans to our defence plans. Sounds pretty logical, doesn't it? Well, NATO hasn't done that since the end of the Cold War. It's not about soldiers. They're relatively cheap and NATO's got quite a lot of them. But the so-called enablers are really in short supply. Missile defence of the sort that protects Ukrainian cities, air and rail transport, ammunition, port facilities, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance assets. The list goes on. We urgently need to improve the capacity of our defence industrial production in the short term to help Ukraine and in the longer term so that we can defend ourselves if we need to. European defence production has been plagued by the inability to move beyond national interests. So can we do that now? It won't be easy because we're trying to make these shifts at a time of economic pressure in our countries anyway. You've heard the UK say recently that it's time to move to 2.5% of GDP to go on to defence, but they didn't feel they could put a timetable on it. Has this message that has been sort of agreed at state level in NATO, has it cut through to our electorate? Not yet. Are people willing to pay again as they did during the Cold War for this type of defence? I don't know. It's a hard sell when Russia is less of a threat to military nations and it, uh, to NATO nations than it has been for years. Even Baltic generals will tell you that the current threat of conventional armed attack from Russia is low. The relationship with Ukraine is also complex. As I said, no one wants NATO to become a party to the war, despite the willingness of nations to supply lethal aid. But there is a desire to develop a, a relationship with Ukraine that's short of membership. How best do we do that? We're struggling with it. Likewise, NATO has partnership with other countries that are going through tough times and we're developing further support for those that NATO thinks are most risk, Moldova, Georgia and Bosnia-Herzegovina. The spillover of this conflict into a wider regional or global war can't be fully excluded, but the good news is it seems unlikely for now. The risk of Putin using nukes seems to have decreased from a few months ago and be assured that the West is watching very closely for any sign of that changing. There could be a change if Ukraine got sufficient ground, especially towards Crimea. And some think that if Putin fell, there are others around like Patricia who might not be as restrained as Putin. Be careful what you wish for. Meanwhile, Putin's decision to withdraw from New START, the final uh, arms control agreement, means that we could be making way for more nuclear tests. We could see an upping in nuclear rhetoric and posturing, and we could be in for an extremely uncomfortable time. And then there's the big question. How does this war end? To be honest, we don't even have a definition of what that really means, let alone how we would manage it. The Alliance isn't talking about how to manage a stalemate. It's not what Ukraine wants. And we're not talking about it. We're not really talking about what happens beyond this year. We're not talking about post-war European security. We botched our last attempt to find a way to live with Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Have we learned any lessons? We don't know yet. So my last little bit, that's all been about Europe. And without diminishing the crisis in Europe, we do need to look wider. The economic consequences of the Ukraine-Russia conflict have been felt in our energy bills, but elsewhere, it's been felt in food insecurity that's only been partly mitigated by the deal brokered by the UN and Turkey on grain. Coupled with climate change and the demographics of Africa, that will trigger further migration. Are we ready for that? Growing instability in the Sahel, in Mali, in the Central African Republic, in Burkina Faso plays into this too. We're leaving those areas, but the Russians aren't. They're there in the shape of Wagner, but also with a sophisticated and coordinated information campaign that our governments recognise, but haven't yet managed to counter. In the Middle East, Bibi's back in power and the divisions are already clear. Iran's posing a number of problems, the nuclear programme, the support for Russia, cyber attacks, and now, of course, taking hostages of uh, dual nationals. Saudi Arabia under Mohammed bin Salman is no longer the restrained actor that it used to be. And the kingdom faces the long-term challenge of a decarbonising world. 
And then there's Asia. As I said, I'm not going to talk about China, but will China take uh, action against Taiwan? And who will get elected US president in 2024? And what will that mean? The backdrop to all of this is a global South that thinks it's time to change an international order that's too favourable to developed nations, that the rest of the world should have a bigger say. With the UN Security Council hostage to vetoes, development goals being missed, failure to deliver results on climate change and nations severely indebted due to things they can't control, such as the Ukraine-Russia war, it's hard to disagree. And whilst we in the West aren't thinking about it much, Russia and China are portraying themselves as the guys on the side of the less developed world, whilst also striking exploitative deals. Of course, the West needs to focus on the threat from Russia. We obviously need to help Ukraine fight as it fights our common adversary. But it's not all about tanks or defence spending. NATO and the wider developed world really needs to up its political game too. We need to think now about how to end the war. We need to think about how to do that without selling out Ukraine and without starting a nuclear war. Then we need to think about how to live alongside Russia. And we don't know what that Russia would look like. We need to avoid ceding the global south to Russia and China. And above all, my final remark is that it's probably time to be open to a change to the post-1945 settlement. Mm -hmm. That's it. I am really honoured and happy to be here today in Somerville College, where I spent a remarkable year doing my uh, postdoctoral research with my supervisor, Peter Oppenheimer, who is also present here today. Uh, I am pleased to share with you my take on the uh, war with Ukraine. Being born in Bakhmut and uh, having a lot of relatives and many friends till recently in Bakhmut, I think it would be interesting for you to listen to uh, the personal story and my, uh, uh, my, my story about uh, Bakhmut and situation in Eastern Ukraine in general. Uh, in addition, I would also like to touch the energy sector because I also served in the first uh, Zelensky government as a deputy minister of energy and environment when I was responsible for energy strategy, including green energy strategy and renewables etc. And I would like to say a few words about the war impact on this. It's difficult uh, to describe uh, all the horror uh, and tragedy which uh, Bakhmut experienced and Ukraine experienced these days. I was personally in Bakhmut and uh, uh, I grew up there. I spent 23 years there and I have a lot of relatives there still. And I was in Ukraine till recently. So I experience all the war from the very beginning till December when I left the country with my family. I have kids, but still I have my parents, uh, my relatives all, all over the place. Many of them fled Bakhmut and they ended up in different places. Some of them live with my parents in my house, but it's tragic and it's difficult to describe. And uh, probably I, I thought it's a good idea to show you some pictures some images of the places which I spent my childhood, where I spent uh, very remarkable days and uh, just to show you how it looks now today and uh, what implications the war brought to us. This is my kindergarten. I am not sure whether you can... No, it's a real uh, video. It's just the beginning of the uh, attack on Bakhmut, I think in August last year, but you still can hear uh, the uh, missiles landing around. And this is uh, destroyed completely to rubble, as you can see. And that was a very old building, more than 100, 100 years old, and uh, now it does not exist at all. This is my school. Uh, the first image on the left, you can see this was uh, also around September last year when it was partially damaged, as you can see, as you can see, but uh, the second image was a recent one from December, uh, maybe November, I believe that was uh, the building, which was also historical and uh, very memorable, where I spent 10 years, uh, was completely destroyed. Actually, as all schools in, uh, in my 
hometown and uh, I don't know the reason but uh, when the war started uh, the schools were targeted probably uh, uh, Russians believe that uh, you know it's uh, main target because of uh, uh, military base I don't know or some reason but or they did it on purpose to destroy the culture and educational system it's difficult to say. By the way, I wanted to also make a remark that I'm expressing my personal views. I'm not uh, here as an EBRD employee, and uh, this is my personal story. This is a musical school, uh, which also attended for five years. It's also a beautiful and historical building. This is a wind picture from one side only, but you can see the huge hole in the wall uh, from missile. And, uh, uh, it's just next corner from uh, my mom building. This is a uh, musical college which I also uh, attended uh, after I finished musical school. So I played clarinet and saxophone and uh, spent some time uh, doing music in Bakhmut, which was also famous uh, in music in in Ukraine. So they, uh, as you can see, the half of the college is completely destroyed by the big missile. This is a youth palace, also beautiful historic uh, building uh, and uh, it's in the city center where uh, we used to go several times a week, weekends, when we practice with, uh, uh, with the band, uh, uh, jazz band, and uh, now it's uh, also destroyed unfortunately. This is a concert hall, uh, which is also uh, a, a great, beautiful building where we also performed uh, with my friends uh, when I was uh, 18, 20 years old. And uh, still these memories are fresh and I wanted to show this to my kids who unfortunately didn't manage uh, to visit Bakhmut because they're still small and the war started rightly so, uh, not now, but uh, eight years ago. and. Uh, we didn't have this possibility and now uh, I'm, I'm not sure what they're going to see uh, and this is a building where I spent around five years but where my mom uh, grew up uh, and uh, this is uh, also in the city center it's on the fire this is a uh, from build uh, picture from the January and this year and uh, this is uh, as you can see building is a kind of stands but there are a lot of fires like this almost in every building in the city because there are no fire brigade nobody can uh, finish the fire so this is unfortunately situation i don't think there is any uh, single building in bakhmut now which is not damaged most of them destroyed i would say 70 percent buildings destroyed there's no possibility to repair but probably they need to be rebuilt completely but some buildings like this are still lucky, but we don't know what happened in the next month or so. And this is a main square. Show with it how to play. This is a main square and main street as it as it is of one month ago. This is a city hall and this big uh, pedestrian area which we crossed, I, I cross it daily going from school to my uh, home or to visit my grandmother or to visit my uh, uh, musical school. But now it's destroyed, but it was uh, a month ago. I, I'm afraid now it's even worse. I saw pictures this building does not exist anymore, but this is a very historical and beautiful center which uh, uh, you can look uh, how they look now. So as you can see, Bakhmut is very beautiful, uh, was very beautiful and uh, quite historic city. And uh, uh, now uh, it, uh, 
it's uh, damaged and uh, some buildings were built as i said 10 years 100 years ago and uh, sorry it's difficult to speak because a lot of memories but uh, the uh, bakhmut was uh, founded 450 years so it's the oldest uh, city in the donetsk region in eastern part of ukraine because it was founded well b before uh, the soviet union so what kind of messages uh, as a being uh, from eastern ukraine and uh, as a person who knows uh, eastern ukraine well and uh, lived there what i would like also to summarize uh, from my point of view first of all uh, also all Although the Russian language was prevailed in uh, and uh, spoken by a vast majority, Bakhmut citizens never identified themselves as Russians, as never I did or my parents. Uh, no, the, we, we never had Russian flags or uh, promotion of uh, Russian culture in the past, at least in my childhood. So there was no uh, strong kind of sentiment about Russia. Ukrainian culture in form of uh, and traditions in form of folklore, national songs, performances was always performed on stage when I was in school. We did a lot of performance or later was always uh, promoted and there was uh, by by themselves. So there was no kind of uh, uh, pro-Russian uh, views or uh, performances. So all population is also interesting fact that my grandmother, she lived in Bakhmut uh, countryside as a small village. She uh, she spoke uh, fluent Ukrainian. So before industrialization, after the Second World War, uh, so before she was born in 1920, uh, the population spoke uh, poor Ukrainian, fluent Ukrainian. So there was a, there was a forceful uh, Russification of people and uh, was a lot of people came from Russia during the industrialization time, including my mom. Actually, I also have a kind of uh, quite common, uh, f uh, you know, family in that region. My mom, when she was two years old, she was uh, brought from Urals region for industrialization in 1950s uh, to build a new factory, but she uh, assimilated as ukrainian she she never was a uh, pro-russian we despite that we spoke russian language in the family my father was ukrainian and we always uh, felt ourselves as ukrainian so there was no never a kind of russian sen sentiment so uh, and after soviet union collapse that became even more uh, evident so uh, that there was no ties and the uh, ties which existed uh, during Soviet Union times, they were kind of broken. So what I want to say, basically, that uh, there was no need, and the, what you hear, sometimes it's uh, propaganda, there was no need to liberate or to help us, or to there was no uh, reason to invade, and that, that uh, people lived happily. We attended schools, uh, Ukrainian schools, we, some lessons were taught in there was, there was no I issue of language so there was a no issue of uh, uh, nationalism or, or something else so there was uh, people living uh, and they had ukrainian identity and there was no need to uh, to interfere and to 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 come as aggressor to our motherland so in few words about uh, energy sector which is my uh, more kind of professional topic because yeah, I spent last uh, 20 years uh, doing uh, green energy mostly and uh, in different countries but uh, also in Ukraine and I would like to show uh, this picture this is a, a map which shows you what kind of places what stations uh, power stations were attacked by Russian uh, over the last year and as you can see there is a statistics even but the, the latest on february i think it's more now because there was a recent attack in march so as you can see the highest uh, level was in november and uh, this orange uh, but it's not only kiev or eastern ukraine it's all over the places you can see this attacks and uh, i must say 
this uh, we have different types of power generation the key one is a thermal generation based on coal this is a 50 percent of uh, ukrainian electricity production now about 50 percent of this uh, power generation is in occupied territories every single power stations were attacked by russia and uh, some of them were attacked several times so there is no there is no single unit power generation unit which was not attacked or damaged or uh, uh, distracted completely by by russia there is also large hydro plants big uh, run of the river large hydro plants and every single uh, large hydro plants which is very crucial for stability of the energy system uh, was also attacked uh, by russia uh, natural gas we have also plenty of reserve around 10 percent already occupied uh, coal about 60 percent occupied uh, now by russian and all about 10 percent on the occupied territories but despite all this uh, ukraine continue uh, uh, producing electricity it's resilient we had power cuts uh, my parents also suffered from power cuts uh, there was a one very long uh, they suffered three days and when when there is a power cut there is no internet there is no mobile uh, connection there is nothing you know and i couldn't reach my parents for three days and i didn't know what uh, i mean is going on because uh, there was a complete outage it was in november but uh, they have a power generator when they can switch on and leave if needed and uh, you know but uh, this kind of situation was all over ukraine uh, this winter but uh, we are lucky that winter finished and was warm winter and uh, we we kind of uh, pass it through and you can see on this page it's uh, this kind of blackout i'm talking about actually 23rd of november you see satellite picture with the uh, lights uh, image from ukraine and that day when there was no blackout you can see on the left side there was no lights almost all over ukraine there was some small uh, lights in western but that's it and before it was uh, like the same uh, like in poland or neighborhood countries it's evident from the satellite on renewable energy ukraine was doing really well and growing fast from almost one gigawatt to eight gigawatt in five years basically eight times growth and uh, the share of production also increased eight times as you can see almost from one percent to eight percent in the power energy mix but now 25 percent of renewable uh, generation occupied mostly is wind 80 percent of all wind is on occupied because uh, they built it on in south uh, of ukraine or eastern ukraine and this t territory is occupied unfortunately solar is not that bad uh, but about 10 percent is damaged or destroyed the impact uh, is uh, estimated but again at this stage it's 2 billion euro for renewable energy and around 10 billion for the whole energy sector these are images from the wind farm this is a real image uh, from the south in Kherson region the wind farm was uh, also targeted and on fire this is a solar park in Mykolaiv region also in south which was uh, taken back by Ukraine actually and this was picture was made afterwards now there are a lot of talks and uh, meetings discussions uh, about rebuilding Ukraine and uh, I would like just to stress uh, for, for key consideration which are important uh, for Ukraine First of all, I mean, the source of funding uh, for rebuilding Ukraine. Second, role of private sector. Uh, third one is the long-term sustainability consideration and build back greener uh, approach. So in uh, terms of source of funding, unfortunately now, uh, because of situation, we see mostly public sources, mostly donor support to the government of Ukraine. And... Uh, this is an emergency situation and uh, it's not probably perfectly uh, transparent and well spent but this is needed because you cannot spend time on 
transparency and procurement if you have a blackout and you need to repair in one day. So, but this is a, a emergency situation, but we believe the private capital is more important go going forward. But now we, it is missing. But given the scarce resources of public funds in the future, the West and uh, donors cannot uh, rebuild Ukraine completely. I think most Ukrainians, everyone understands that we need to use these public funds effectively and leverage private investments. And uh, this is a way uh, forward. Um, Long-term sustainability is also important because, you know, Ukraine was heavily dependent on Russian gas, but now uh, any more, not anymore. And this climate change consideration is very important and uh, climate resilience. Ukraine already uh, demonstrated is a resilient country and uh, it uh, was doing well before the war, but now with uh, this coal-based uh, generation damage, I think the goal for Ukrainian government and the society is to rebuild greener, renewable energy Ukraine and with a more decentralized um, source, because it was centralized from Soviet Union times and was easy target uh, by Russia. Russians also played uh, uh the role in building and so they knew the targets and there was an easy target for them and there was many evidence when that uh, electric engineers were involved in a military operation when they helped uh, the military to define the targets and the best timing and the best uh, location uh, how to, where to hit unfortunately but uh, given this i think uh, ukraine will focus on uh, renewable source and more decentralized small scale uh, resources everywhere. And it's already happening. We see more and more uptake of solar PV on the roofs or uh, small installation uh, for the big factories. And the, I think also important to have built back a greener strategy similar to the UK actually. And uh, uh, because there are a lot of talks, I mean, among donors, but uh, unfortunately, as it's always the case, little uh, cooperation and coordination. So everybody is helping, but I think there is no clear vision and plan how to do it in an effective way. And I think this kind of plan build back greener should be developed with help of international donors and private sectors and become an anchor for future assistance and investments. I think this is it. I'm happy to answer all the questions uh, and uh, happy to be here. Thank you. All right. Fantastic. Um, thank you so very much for those two very important and fascinating talks. Um, let us now open the floor to questions from the audience. Um, I would only ask you to introduce yourself before you ask before you ask your question, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Is that the right distance? Yes, I'm not going to ask my former supervisee anything, uh, but I would like to respond uh, to the ambassador's point about whether anything that NATO did after 2415 deterred Russia. And there are two aspects to my response. First, as far as Ukraine is concerned, it deterred only insofar as Putin was waiting to see what NATO and the West would do, and that takes time. And after several years, it became clear the answer is nothing much. And that includes, by the way, the revelation by Elliot Higgins and his organization of who had shot down the Malaysian, uh, you know, killed several hundred West Europeans. So they just waited. But I've got another thing that the ambassador might have mentioned, uh, said to me by a very well-known political scientist in Russia, without being sensational, I'm not going to name him or her in public, but I will tell the ambassador, if she's interested, who it was, who said that um, if the Baltic, the three Baltic states, right, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, had not joined NATO, 
Russia would have reoccupied then before attacking Ukraine. One of the things that I sort of think about the, in, the invasion of Ukraine is, was it, I mean, it wasn't NATO policy to deter it anyway, but even if we had been trying to deter it, was it really deterrable? I mean, I think that um, in some ways, I mean, Putin has this myth about Ukraine and, and so referred to it in, in what he talked about, about the things that weren't true that have been said about Ukrainian and the, uh, and the problems, particularly in the Donetsk region and so forth and the Donbass. And, um, but also there it's, all nations have a, a sort of narrative and a, and a myth that they tell themselves. I mean, in the UK, it's that we stood alone against the Nazis. I mean, and, you know, that, there it is. It's not really true. It's partly true. And, but it's, and, and all nations have that. Now, the story about Russia and Ukraine is one of those myths on which Russian nationalism is based. And so you wonder whether anything that the West could do could have actually changed anything. Uh, and I think, unfortunately, the situation with China and Taiwan is probably similar. Is it something that we can actually deter? I don't know. Uh, I just think it when it comes part of that national storytelling of identity and so forth, then deterrence is a really difficult thing to do. Um, on the terms of the Baltic states, yes. Um, and my deputy um, is from Latvia and uh, I go to the Baltic states a lot. Uh, and I agree the protection that they have because they were lucky enough to be taken into the alliance uh, when they were has changed the world for them. And it's a tragedy for Ukraine that they're not in that situation. So I think you're absolutely right. Hi, um, oh, I'm very loud. <laughs> Thank you both for um, these very, very interesting presentations. Um, obviously, you know, take my hat off to you in particular, Siahu, um, for everything you and your um, family must have been through in the last um, couple of years. Um, I wanted to ask a slightly more, um, I suppose, procedural question about some of the content which, Siahu, you've demonstrated. I noticed some of that, your footage was from Telegram channels um, focused on Bakhmut. Um, and I just wanted to ask what um, for both of your opinions on what the proliferation of open source content we've seen throughout the war um, has meant either for inter-country intelligence sharing, um, Ukraine's response, uh, or what it might mean for Russia going forward um, in terms of human rights abuse documentation um, and the other types of documentary evidence which have come, or just any thoughts you have about the, the pluses or minuses of, of this complete saturation of the information environment relating um, to the war. Um, thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, there are a lot of information coming from uh, my friends who stayed there till uh, recently. I think uh, one of our friends, family friends, stay is still there. Uh, his uh, uh, family moved, uh, I think, a month ago. So many, many pictures, many videos came from them, which I know, or from our neighbors, like the recorded buildings. There are still people, apparently reported, like, 4,000 people in Bakhmut months ago, maybe now it's a bit less, but yeah, they're coming from uh, private channels, but th indeed the uh, Telegram channel is uh, also a key uh, source of information uh, for Ukrainians and uh, as far as I know also for Russians and uh, a lot of manipulation and there is a lot of also kind of uh, special operations information campaigns about it but uh, and it's for especially for for outsiders it's difficult to understand what is truth and what is manipulation uh, for me as uh, you know having friends relative there and knowing all these buildings myself and uh, following a daily basis uh, the situation it's easy to, uh, to to tell and filter this channel so i have believe me i have like 20 different uh, channels when I receive information and I can filter and can see and use uh, for, for myself what is reliable information or not. But more importantly, I have uh, people, my friends and my relatives there who uh, can report. But I was, I mean, in Bakhmut, uh, 
myself uh, before the war, so there was uh, no kind of no no surprise for me to see this. Open source intelligence. I mean, it's a really old thing, isn't it? A phrase, as a phrase, open source intelligence. So it doesn't really make any sense. But anyway, we all know what you mean. And I think, um, I mean, it's been amazing to see it. Um, and I think it's been really important in an era of disinformation that there are people out there, uh, uh, you know, burying into it. And people like Bellingcat have done, done amazing stuff in, in helping us all to understand what's going on. I think it's been really important. And I think at the beginning of the war, I mean, what was really incredible was to see um, ordinary Ukrainian citizens using their phones to take photographs of Russian movements that they were seeing, sending them into the Ukrainian authorities, all the metadata being used from those pictures um, and, you know, and targeting uh, and that being turned very quickly into targeting information to take out those units. I mean, unbelievable to see that happening in real time and just ordinary people becoming part of the Ukrainian armed response to uh, to the invasion. Amazing. I think disinformation and understanding what's real and what's not real is really difficult and we work really hard to try to try and get that and the volume of information that there is out there and just being able to get through it is incredibly difficult um i think after what happened um before 20 years ago now on the iraq, iraq and the wmd you know of course people are very cautious about saying what they think is going on um intelligence sharing oddly until really a year ago was still problematic inside the alliance um it could still be better but it's vastly vastly better than it was a year ago in fact my american colleague the other day was saying that um at the beginning of uh 22 um it was taking three weeks for a, in american intelligence that he could see in order to be able to tell someone like me or even our commander about it, it was taking three weeks to get the permissions in order to do that. It now happens in about three hours. So, I mean, that's a remarkable change. Um, whether, you know, how is it enough? Probably not. Have we got enough um, sort of uh, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance assets to get what we want so that we really know what's going on using our own sources? No, we haven't. Um, and that's something we really need to invest in. It's me. Yeah. Uh, Adrian Phillips. Um, I think this is a question for Catherine, actually, but thank you both for your, your, um, your presentations and those pictures of Bakhmut were deeply moving. Just to just mentioned last night, we were at a concert in Cheltenham where the Dimitro, Dimitro uh, Opera were gave a stirring performance of Aida, and that was a, the audience responded with a huge amount of enthusiasm. Um, we think of the United States as being the linchpin of NATO, but I sometimes feel that it might be the weakest link. And, and there's a couple of reasons why that is. First of all, I think that China and the Pacific and the eastward, well, for us, eastward, but for them, westward facing profile is the thing that will increasingly absorb the Americans' attention in future. And secondly, because there, there are some pretty weird politicians buzzing around who conceivably might be elected within 18 months. So I suppose there's a couple of questions that come from that. Um, one, uh, is there anything that, that we can do to help the Americans make the right decision next year? Uh, and, and secondly, and rather more brutal, um, is it conceivable that NATO could survive against the Russian aggression um, without American support? Okay, the second one first, as of today, no. Um, and I haven't got any qualms about saying that. I mean, the American capability is just, it, it's, it's just extraordinary compared to the European capability. And it's things like the enablers, it's like the anti-missile systems, it's like the strategic lift capability, it's basic stuff. I mean, let's face it, we couldn't do Afghanistan without them. We had to leave when they left because we couldn't do it without them. And that tells you everything you want to know. So the only thing I, that Donald Trump ever said that I agreed with was that the Europeans need to up their game on their, on, on their defence. We've been getting a free ride for a very long time and, um, and we need to acknowledge that and we need to do something about it if we're, if we're, if we're serious about it. I mean, why, 
shouldn't the Americans expect us to be uh, as interested as they've been in Europe in the problems that will conceivably come from China? I mean, they've got every right to 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 expect that. And it's not just, of course, the dollars; it's the lives. When you look at things like Afghanistan, the numbers of Americans who died there. I mean, you know, they made they made a huge sacrifice, and um, uh, and we 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 should acknowledge that. What could we do? to stop Donald coming back, God only knows. I mean, I, I mean, I think that, I, I mean, that polarization you see in the States is, is, is sort of difficult to understand. But I mean, you know, in this country, we're nearer to it than most of continental Europe is, but, um, but we, we still don't really understand the depths of it and, and, and where it's coming from. I mean, I think the only thing we can do is to work with the current American government to get help show that they are actually getting results and things are getting better. Um, and that can do, we can do that in the international sphere. We can't really do it in the domestic sphere. Um, but working and showing that international cooperation works, I think is, is the best thing we can do. Hello, uh, Caroline Morell. Thank you both. This is a very simplistic, naive question. Russia is already the biggest country in the world understand it has a lot of social and economic problems. Its territory has never been encroached upon by NATO countries, although it might be surrounded by them. Why? Why is Putin doing this? Can answer that better than I can. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, the reason I don't want to answer it is that I couldn't possibly try and understand what is in Putin's mind. I mean, you know, in, in the Russian mind. I mean, I think this... Um, there is this myth, as I talked about, that, you know, Ukraine is part of this greater Russian empire. It's part of the past, the relationship they had. And it's just that feeling that, you know, this is this is something I mean, in a way we've gone through. We've been a long time in a post imperial world. Has Russia been in a post imperial world? I'm not sure. I mean, I think it's probably still in an imperial world. I don't know what if you want to add anything to that. For, for us, it's an imperialistic war, and the Russia keeps uh, uh, trying, you know, to keep an empire in place. And uh, this is aggression, national, and imperialistic war. And Ukraine uh, has a long history. I don't want to, you know, talk about it here. But uh, for us, yeah, it's a clear sign. This is a big brother, and I'm actually now based in Kosovo, and it's also a similar situation. I can see, I can see uh, from another big brother. And uh, this is an uh, imperialistic syndrome, as much as like, we face. Thank you. Um, thank you both for very interesting presentations. Jill Bennett, I, I wanted to just pick up on the last thing Catherine said about whether the post Second World War order uh, needs to change and to mention the United Nations where obviously, uh, you know, it is not quite so closely related to uh, Ukraine, but of course it is when we see what's happened. And one of the things about the 1945 um, order is the Security Council, its membership, and the fact of the veto, which means that you're always going to get into this difficulty with, uh, with Russia as a member of the P5. But on the other side, you've got the General Assembly which gives a lot more scope for powers like Russia to exert influence over the Global South uh, because there are so many countries in the General Assembly and where it means that powers like India, whom we also ought to mention, are in a much more difficult position as to which way they're going to go. Now, I'm not expecting you to sort out UN reform in the next five minutes, but I, do, I would be interested to hear what you thought about this thanks i i mean i totally agree with you i mean the security council is completely hampered by the vetoes and it's you know it's almost irrelevant to this story which is tragic really i mean you know there was that golden period after the end of the cold war when actually the security council was doing stuff and it was really quite exciting and uh, uh and here we are back in deadlock um the General Assembly is really interesting, and I think the votes in the General Assembly have been interesting as well. The um, 
as I said, I think the, the Russians were were busy and lobbying. And when you look at where, you know, at one point, I, I don't know why, but we my, my team, we were sitting down one day and somebody sort of said, haven't heard from Sergei Lavrov lately. Where the hell is he? And we started then to have a look where, you know, started to do a search and find out where Lavrov had been. And lo and behold, he'd been all over the, the global south. Um, looking for sympathy and, and and support and solutions, and I, and and we were thinking, wow, actually, you know, are we doing anything like that? And the answer was, we weren't. Um, but our nations have woken up to that and have started doing a better job. Um, there is going to be, um, understandably, a temptation if you're India uh, or Brazil or any of the other um, nations that feels that they are not listened to enough. Um, to use this as leverage to try and change things. So, you know, to put pressure on and to sort of, you know, to try and exact a price for their votes, for if you like, for doing the right thing. But, but you can't really blame them because I think the level of frustration is now getting quite high. And I think when we were delivering on things like Millennium Development Goals, I mean, people have forgotten we did incredibly well on that. And then we lost it. And I think, you know, as things ro rode back after 9-11 and all of the, you know, the decade of, of, of the war on terrorism and all of that sort of stuff, a huge amount of things that were going in the right direction stalled. Um, and I'm not sure we can get it back without actually doing some reform. And I think when you look at things like, you know, how um, the international financial institutions work, um, you know, you you understand why these nations feel that that they need that access to investment. So it's not even just political support; it's really hard cash. Um, will it? What will it change? I don't know. I think for the Americans in particular, this would be such a change in the world order. It's difficult to imagine what would bring them to do it. But I think if they don't do it, um, we're going to find it very difficult to get support for things that we 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 want and we need to do. So um, put a timetable on it. I don't know. I think it needs to happen in the next decade. I don't know if you want to say something about the international financial institutions on that basis, because that's that's where some of the power of inequalities are really worked. No, yeah, I wanted to mention climate change is another big uh, problem, which is also unfortunately delayed at the global level. We see talks, you know, this COP conference of parties, COPs uh, annually, but unfortunately there is no much progress and real kind of action apart from talks the same for also i'm a part of a uh, international financial institution i can be also open with you uh, there, there was a call to reform uh, these institutions as well because there are a lot of uh, talks but not enough uh, bravery risk appetite as we call it uh, to do projects you know to invest you know to be first and to spend money uh, unfortunately but there are, you know, issues of bureaucracy, issues of big organization, and uh, there are, and as I, as being Ukrainian, I can see and can say that all of IFIs uh, could do much more and better job uh, to support Ukraine and uh, not just lend into the government or big state-owned enterprises. There are much more to do, but, you know, uh, it's more difficult from headquarters and it it it, it will require actions and uh, more risks and uh, which they are not prepared to take thank you um i'm andre i was a student here 25 years ago i lived a stone throw north of here uh, but um, between 2020 and 2022, I worked in Donbass. Uh, how much time do I have for a question? So basically, let's start with some comments. Uh, said he, excellent presentation. Uh, we have all our memories from before the war and during the war from that region, those of us who were there. Uh, and because of the nature of my job at that time, I had to travel around the region. So Bakhmut, I visited several times. Uh, I visited actually the musical school, which you just showed on the, of the pictures, and working and interacting with local populations and with uh, local authorities, etc. Uh, I can certainly say that uh, I did not see any discrimination against Russian-speaking population there. So Russian, Ukrainian were both spoken on the street, mostly Russian, 
uh, as you rightly said, people identify themselves as Ukrainians. So this is one of the premises for the for starting of the conflict that there was discrimination of the Russian speaking populations, Russians were ever living in the in the region, in my view, and in view of many of us, obviously, that was absolutely, um, absolutely not true. I understand both Ukrainian and Russian. None of them are my native language. Uh, neither is English, as you can hear. But uh, so basically, this is this is the entire story. We have lots of stories. When, uh, for example, I had to take, uh, I had to help to take a member of my staff from uh, Mariupol, where he was hiding in the basement during the siege. Uh, I had to supervise the convoy of 300 people, my staff members and their families moving from uh, Donbass to, to the Western Ukraine, which was more safe, safer at that time. Uh, I don't know whether you have the same experiences or whether you have the same um, uh, the same kind of uh, pattern of behavior at the moment. Whenever there is an information that somewhere a missile struck, etc., and you know the place, you look for the street. Because I, I stayed, for example, in Kramatorsk. So whenever the missiles stuck, uh, strike anywhere, being it um, the, the train station, which I know very well because I was using it on an almost daily basis, or any other street, and the other building, you look for the street because you want to know where it exactly happened because you can locate it. Like I can locate it because I remember the streets of Bahmut because I was traveling there uh, quite often. Uh, in terms of uh, how the war can finish, we don't know. Uh, the, the word negotiation is probably uh, not acceptable at that time. From In my head, how I see it, the only solution is restoring of Ukraine sovereignty with its internationally recognized borders. That meaning Crimea will be part of, again, part of Ukraine and the entire region of, of Donbass. Is that possible? Uh, it is difficult to say. And the last point on, on, on Catherine's presentation, which was, which was absolutely uh, fantastic, absolutely amazing, um, in terms of when the war really started, right? Uh, it depends on the perspective. 2014 is, is a great date, let's say, for, for the thing. But, for example, for uh, maybe for my Ukrainian colleagues, the war started during the the, the Battle of Poltava in 1709. <laughs> for my country, the war started 1772. This is a very, very kind of historically um, important date. So uh, there has always been a war there. There were just little moments of peace. And I think the best descriptions of what was happening there especially um, in the middle of the 20th century, is Timothy Snyder's book entitled Bloodlands, which basically shows what has been happening there. Uh, and the last point, if I may, I, I am sorry that I didn't have a, a more precise questions and rather comments, is that uh, you mentioned about, uh, Serhi, you mentioned about your mother coming from Ural and, uh, and during the Soviet industrialization era settling in, uh, in, uh, in Donbass. Uh, and your Ukrainian, uh, grandmother who was born then in the 1920s and was speaking Ukrainian at home, etc., etc. Uh, the reason your mother went from Ural there is not only for the industrialization. The reason is that that the region was depopulated from the original Ukrainian population by Stalin in the 1930s, when uh, there were mass starvations happening uh, on the ground. This is one of the reasons why there was a new population who moved there. Even though the new Soviet population, let's say it moved there, they now, and historically in the last decades, associated themselves with the Ukrainian country because they're part of Ukraine. They, uh, they are Ukrainians. Uh, I have all sorts of many other things to say, but I'm probably taking too much of your time. So, thank you. Can I ask you where you're from? Polish, thank you. No, because you, you, you talked about a lot of things, but you didn't tell us that detail. Thank you for that. It was really interesting. Excuse me. So um, I'm Jeremy Good. Um, I made myself slightly unpopular saying that this war is all our fault. It's we had an opportunity for peace in Europe in 1990 when Gorbachev and Reagan walked in Red Square and uh, signed people autographs and so on. And we lost it, basically, in the peace of Europe, because we failed to support Russia 
changing its uh, economic behavior, and we allowed the oligarchs to get in, and we watched with, and unfortunately with some people's pleasure, the humiliation of Russia, and that's why we've got Putin. It's very much us who put him in power. It's very like in 1919, when the Treaty of Versailles was signed, and what did Marshal Foss say? That is not a peace treaty, it's a 20-year armistice, and he was right on the nail. Or the famous long telegram, Mr. Kennan. So we, we set up the ground for what happened. I think Ukraine is a bit like Britain's relationship with Ireland. Ireland is part of the British Isles and was for 700 years ruled from Westminster. But nevertheless, the Irish Sinn Féin means ourselves alone. And eventually that had to be resolved. But there was a plebiscite and certain counties voted to remain part of the United Kingdom. But other Irish nationalists said that's not acceptable. And they continued a low level conflict for the next 80 years from 1922 until, well, it's still going on a bit. And this is what Ukraine has to face up to, because there was a referendum in 1914 or just before, 60% said Ukraine should be facing west to Europe, 40% voted to be pro-Russian. What's happened to those 40%? And what thought was given to their position? I think I'm correct, there were three national languages in Ukraine, Hungarian, Ukrainian, and Russian. After the Ukrainian nationalists came to power, the other two were made not official. That was not a helpful thing to do, and it partly accounts for why the Hungarian government is not terribly happy either. So, you know, it's a huge failure of Western diplomacy what has happened, and we are going to pay a high price for it, because now, the first, you know, in 1990 we could say, for the first time in my life, we did not have the four minute warning and kiss your ass goodbye. Now we are back to that state. I sort of feel like I, when I was in Northern Iraq in the early 1990s and I had to apologize for the Treaty of Sevres of 1921 because they felt that someone should apologize. So it may as well be me, so I did. But you know, so, I mean, I actually did say that I thought we botched our, our role after the, the, the fall of the Soviet Union, we definitely did. And um, um, and we we did it because we, we actually did change their economic system. In fact, the oligarchs with the rise came through from the, you know, the insistence on the whole privatization thing and all the rest of it. And, you know, of course, who, you know, who was around in, in our countries at the time? Well, you know, Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher. So it's not surprising that we ended up with a neocon solution to how you're going to do the economy of it. So um, <laughs> we don't agree with me on that, but that was there. That... But she, she all of us were involved in what we decided to do in Russia. And what we decided to do in Russia was push privatization. And funnily enough, all the, all the private, uh, uh, you know, as they privatized the, uh, the economy in, in what was the Soviet Union, in Russia at least, it was bought up by the oligarchs and the security people who were in the state security systems. And they bought it up and they became the oligarchs. And, you know, Putin is the KGB. I mean, you know, he is the KGB and you can't sort of get away from it. Um, so, yes, we did, but it's not, I don't think, because of we didn't interfere in their economy, it's because we did interfere in their economy and their different way of doing things. What we didn't do was think about governance. We didn't think about institution building, but it's incredibly difficult. We've learned over, the, over our experiences in the Arab Spring and all of this, this idea that you could export our way of doing governance and, and uh, our way of, of approaching life to other cultures, we've learned that it's not that easy. It's incredibly difficult to do. And in Russia, you have centuries of history, none of which involves democracy, none of it. And, and you know, to sort of think that somehow we could have put that way of ruling into Russia then I, I mean yes we didn't get it right and we made terrible mistakes but i'm not sure that even if we had sort of tried to do that and really put our efforts into that sort of thing we'd have had any success it, i mean the soil has to be fertile for, for any roots to grow i mean it's just so difficult to do this stuff um 
And governing and governance, I think, is one of the least discussed and most important topics in the world. We do not talk. I mean, our governance in this country is weaker than it's ever been in my lifetime. You look at how things are, are going, and this is in a country where we think it's absolutely firmly rooted. You look how close the United States came on the 6th of January to its whole constitutional uh, settlement actually falling apart because people refused to follow the rules. And that, you know, this stuff is fragile and we are struggling to actually keep it together in our own countries. And I think the idea that we could have made Russia different, maybe we could have made it a bit different. I think it would have just been delaying things and you'd have still ended up with the Putins of this world because they were where the power lay in the country. But here you go, it's just my opinion. Just, yeah, one, also one comment. I think it's uh, not really correct to blame someone else. And uh, we should always blame the aggressor. I think I see this in many places that, you know, we try to blame, uh, I mean, West, Ukraine. But uh, who is the uh, uh, victim? Uh, we should not forget this is a Russian aggression. They should be blamed, not the rest. This is the first thing. And uh, I think this is a kind of counterproductive rhetoric. And I feel it. Uh, even promoted by Russian uh, uh, the, everywhere. Uh, this is the first comment. And second, uh, in terms of different, we always had Ukrainian language as a national, as a uh, language in the Putin constitution. People spoke different language. We had many nationalities, not only Hungarians, but Roms, like 20 different nationalities, Poles, many uh, in Ukraine. But there was always friendly environment. There was, but there was only Ukrainian language. Hungarian, Russian was never official language in Ukraine. This is the last question. Uh, if there is, um, if there is no compromise from the Ukrainian side, and I'm not saying there should be, can you conceive of a peace? that in view of the myths, of identity myths that you were expressing about Russia, can you conceive of a piece that wouldn't be ex experienced by Putin and the Russian psyche as a humiliation with all the consequences which we know about after humiliating peace? And I, I, I think that's partly why I say I can't see how it's going to end because, you know, asking Ukrainians to compromise is... It, it, <laughs> I mean, why should you yeah. <laughs> after what you've been through? Um, but I think, you know, at some point there may come a point where the losses are such that a decision is taken that a compromise, which would not be a, a settled state, it would be a pause. And I think we all know that. And that's part of the problem. Um, uh, you know, it may come to that when the losses are just so huge that the, the fight and the intensity it is at the moment can't go on. I think um, I think I really believe that what will be necessary for a real peace is change in Russia. Um, and um, I don't think that's immediate. And as I say, I think it could get worse before it gets better. Um, uh, but I think it's difficult to I mean, you know, I, I, I was saying when we were uh, talking earlier that that I was in Tallinn uh, last May at a, a conference that's at the security sort of uh, political security conference that's held every year. Um, it's always fantastic. And um, last year, there were a load of young Russians there who were people who had been running opposition media, television, radio, um, internet stuff and all of that. And they'd had to leave. Um, and they are all over the sort of Polish Baltic states and all that. And, and they'd been brought together to talk to us about um, how they were still trying to get their messages across in Russia and all do it. And when you meet those people and they are young people, you think there's hope because, you know, these are young urban Russians. And we have to be very clear that the urban Russian society is very different from the rural Russian society and their experience of life is different, too. Um, you know, there is hope that Russia will change. Well, no, sorry. Oh, I just wanted to wrap up. Sorry. Um, well, um, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, coming and for asking very interesting questions. And even more so, I want to thank our panelists for contributing to a such fascinating event. Um, thanks to everybody, and the discussion will continue over coffee. Thank you. Yeah.